Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. We're so glad that you've chosen to worship with us today. Welcome to everyone, whether you're here at the Klein Campus, Center Court East, Center Court West, or if you're up at the Woodlands, or if you are coming to us via online. We're glad that you're worshiping at Faith Bridge. And by the way, if you are with us online, I just wanted to give you a word of encouragement. Um, Don't let it just be an online relationship. You know, the body of Christ is all about community. It's all about relationships. So I want to encourage you that in addition to uh, joining us online to make sure that you get involved in the body of Christ as well. Today we're in for a special treat. Duffy Robbins is back with us. He's got a message for us from the Gospel of John. It's a great message, so let's give him a warm FaithBridge welcome. How's that, guys? Better? Better? Good. Let me do the backup. We got all these redundant systems here. Two mics, and then there's also one catheter. Uh, But uh, anyway, yeah, yeah. You're laughing, but we needed it in the first service. But I uh, wish you could have been here. Powerful. Uh, but uh, thanks so much. For, for, let's just close in prayer. Uh, thanks for letting me be with you again. It's always a treat uh, to be back at, uh, at Faith Bridge. I don't know. I think I've told you guys this before, but, but uh, one of my uh, heroes when I was a little boy was Tarzan. And... Um, and uh, I, mean, I mean, you know Tarzan. Everybody know Tarzan? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, Tarzan, uh, I remember as a little boy, that, he, I just thought Tarzan was so cool. Because Tarzan, first of all, he lived in the jungle. How awesome is that? And, and, uh, and then uh, I love the fact that he could communicate with animals. That was fantastic. Um, and then, of course, he got to, um, you know, I thought it was great that he got to wear that kind of leopard skin, you know, tank teeny. Uh, thing that was, I thought that was pretty awesome. In fact, I wanted to wear one one Halloween, and and my wife said, "No, you'll frighten the children." But uh, but that I thought that was cool. And then uh, and then I I thought uh, I thought it was great that he could go, he could swing through the jungle. I mean, what a! I just remember walking home from the bus stop, going, "Oh wow, what a great! Wouldn't that be great to get home?" And uh, and that was fantastic. Uh, but my my favorite thing about Tarzan. Uh, without question, was his trademark yell. Uh, the trademark, tar- how many of you, and don't be modest here, how many can do a trademark, a good Tarzan yell? Yes, ma'am. I'm oh, just kidding. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, nobody, all right, I tell you what, let's do. This is, this is good. We'll just, let's try this. Well, on the count of three, um, I want you to give me your very best Tarzan yell. Uh, now, I, I, have to, I have a caution here because in the first service, we did that and an elephant walked in. But, uh, but, uh, but no, I want, I want you to give me very best story on the count of three. Are ready? Uh, one, two, three. Oh. You, know, you know what? You said you couldn't. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> but I love that. And, and of course, Tarzan would do that to communicate with, with the animals and stuff. And, 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 and sometimes he would do it because um, the leopard skin deal would get caught in the vine. But, but I, I just remember uh, the thing about Tarzan that used to just intrigue me, uh, no end, was how there was always a vine precisely where he needed it. And it was always loose. Like I would walk in the woods behind our house and if there was a vine, it was always wrapped around. You couldn't, for Tarzan, it was always loose and ready for the swinging. And, and, and it wasn't just loose, it was the right length too, right? Because you know, just think if it had been too long, be, ah, you know, and, uh, or if it was too short, ah, and, and it was always exactly the right length. In fact, I remember I used to have this recurring uh, nightmare. It's troubling. Uh, I used to have this recurring, recurring nightmare where Tarzan would be swinging through the jungle, you know, treetop to treetop to treetop to treetop. And, and then he came to a clearing. 
And, and, and uh, I, I just imagine this blur of, of flesh and, and leopard skin uh, sort of, uh, you know, falling to the earth uh, in a pile and then uh, being surrounded by uh, laughing primates. And, 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 I, and I mention this this morning because, because I, I'm going to tell you something. I, this is one of my concerns about, about, about what happens here on Sunday morning at Faith Bridge. I think one of the hazards of a place like this is if we're not careful, that, that, uh, that, that it would be possible for us to breed a tendency for us to breed what I call Tarzan Christianity. Tarzan Christianity. And we know how this works, but Tarzan Christianity is when you try to live your faith in the high places. You, you try to swing from, from kind of sweet spot to sweet spot. It, it's, it, it's like, okay, Sunday. Sunday, we're all here. Uh, the music is awesome. You've got the, the, the fellowship, the friends. You've got the, the kids' ministry. You've got the teaching. Uh, you've got the parking, the guys that park your car. Well, I mean, they're, what a ministry. This is the only place I ever go where my rental car wants to become a Christian. And, and uh, I mean, it's just, it just unbelievable. You've got all that stuff going on, and you get pumped and you get psyched and it's kind of like right up there at the treetop. We're close to God. The view is exhilarating. And then Monday comes. And it's like back in the jungle. Back to the same stuff, the same hassle, same school, same classes, same friends, same work, same family, same stresses. And it's like this God that felt so near now feels so so different. And, and you just get discouraged. And then wait a minute, here comes another Sunday. And we get pumped and we start all over again. We get psyched. We kind of pound our chest. We scream. We're all Christians. And then comes another Sunday. And that ends on Monday. And then we kind of move back down into the jungle. And, and we end up kind of getting stuck in this cycle where we try to, we swing from spiritual treetop to spiritual treetop. I call that Tarzan, Tarzan Christianity. And the problem with, with that approach to the Christian life, as Oswald Chambers points out, is that genuine faith, authentic faith, is actually what happens between the moments of inspiration. That, that in fact, if our faith isn't real in the jungle, then it's not real at all. It's not real at all. What we're going to see this morning and next Sunday morning is that there is a way to avoid this trap of Tarzan Christianity. There's a way to, to, to live and to thrive even in the midst of, of the perils and the darkness of the jungle. So if you have a Bible, um, why don't you open it to John chapter 15? Let's, let's take a look at this stuff. John chapter 15. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. We'd love to um, make sure you get one right now. We have some folks. That's right. Great. Thank you. And right down there, we'll be happy to make sure you get one. Good. Excellent. John chapter 15, the gospel of John. John's, John's one of those disciples who's a little bit of a mystic. His approach, his take uh, in telling the story of Jesus is a little bit different from the other three uh, gospel writers. Um, and this passage, John chapter 15, is a part of an extended uh, teaching by Jesus. We're going to begin reading in verse 1 of John chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide 
in his love. And then note carefully this last verse, this 11th verse. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Um, over the last uh, few weeks here at Faith Bridge, uh, we've been talking about, about transformation. Uh, how, do we, how do we live this, this transformed life? And how do we do that in authentic ways, um, even in the everyday jungle of, of, of work and, and school and, and family and just, and, and just life? Because it's not easy, right? It's a, it's a jungle out there. I mean, there are, there are perils and, and snares and temptations and, 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 and narrow uh, winding trails. And, and, uh, and as if all that's not bad enough, Peter warns us that our adversary, Satan, uh, is prowling the jungle like a roaring lion seeking those he may uh, de de devour. It's tough. It's, it's, uh, it's discouraging. I think, I think some of us kind of feel um, like, that, like the high school guy. This uh, guy had been to a, a youth retreat. It was a fall retreat. He came back and he was pumped. He was excited. He had given his heart to Christ. And, and, and it, was a, it was a treetop moment for him. And, uh, he really felt a, a closeness to God, an exhilaration uh, of faith that he hadn't felt before. But then he came back home and, and, and he began to face the same struggles and the same temptations and the same issues and same questions. And he began to get discouraged. He, he just he began to wonder, maybe he couldn't do it. Maybe it was a hoax. Maybe it couldn't be real for him. Maybe other people, but not him. And he finally went to see his youth pastor. He said, I've had his, and, he, and, and what he, he's struggling with lust. That was, that was his big thing. He, he, he said, I, I know I shouldn't be thinking these things, but the more I try not to think about them, the more I'm thinking about them. And, and he finally goes to his youth pastor and said, I, I, I've had it, you know. I, I can't do this. I'm trying to be a Christian. I'll never be able to pull it off. I don't blame God for getting mad at me. I'm getting mad at me. He's getting more and more frustrated, more and more discouraged. Finally, he just gets so angry. He just blurts out. He starts pounding on the youth pastor's desk. He said, I'm just going to pray right now. God, just, just take away my sexual desire. And the youth pastor kind of looks at him. He goes, wait a minute. He said, let me leave the room in case he misses. But I... I, I, I I think um, that a lot of us know that, that discouragement. It's a jungle. But Jesus' words in John chapter 15 help us to understand that the key to the transformed life, even in the midst of the jungle, is abiding in Christ. Abiding in Christ. We heard that phrase several times, didn't we, in John chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. Well, what does that mean? Abide in Christ. Because abide is one of those words you don't, you don't hear very often. It's, it's one of those kind of archaic uh, words, one of those kind of religious terms that you don't use in normal uh, conversation. It, it sort of reminds me of the kid who um, he uh, hadn't studied his vocabulary words for English class. And, uh, and, 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 of course, the teacher calls on him that day, and he knows he's been found. He's, he's a dead meat. And, uh, and, and she asks him to make a sentence using the word abide. And he just freezes, and he can't come up with it. And he finds his, uh, he tries to take a stab, but he says, would you give me a bite of pie? And, uh, and, and, uh, and, 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 and that kid today is Dan Slagle. <laughs> no, but, but, I mean, it's... Uh, it, it's, it's one of those words we don't use very often. Um, I, I think one of the best ways to maybe understand um, what it means to abide in Christ is to think of it in terms of what, what some of us refer to as having a personal relationship with Jesus. What, what does it mean to abide in Christ? It means having a personal and intimate relationship with Christ. What it all boils down to is what I like to call uh, a first-hand faith. A first-hand faith. Um, go back with me to the text. Let's look at uh, verse 4 of chapter 15. I want you to notice this, this, this one phrase. Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. Abide in me and I in you. That, that, that's, that's a first hand relationship. I remember as a little boy, my family and I used to travel a lot. We, we did a lot of trips together on weekends, and I loved that. 
Um, but, but the one part about that was a little bit, uh, a little bit painful was that my mom, whenever we'd go away, my mom would actually come into mine and my brother's bedroom on the day of our departure, and she would pack our bags for us. And she did this because she feared that if she didn't pack our bags, we would leave out items that she felt were essential. You know, so we'd, we'd bring like one shoe and, uh, you know, and three bathing suits and, uh, you know, and two pairs of underwear for three weeks. Uh, and, and we'd bring one pair back clean. And, 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 and so she just basically took it upon herself, say, I'm going to pack the bags for everybody. For, for the boys. And so, and, and it wasn't a big deal. I didn't mind it. I never really complained about it because I never had to carry my bag. I was the baby of the family. So my dad, you know, he had to carry his bag. My mom, of course, had to carry her bag. My big brother had to carry his bag. I carried my coloring book. And to this day, when I travel, I, no, it's not true, but, but uh, I, 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 I never complained because I didn't have to, I didn't have to, but there was this part about it that I did not like is that my mom packed a lot of things in our bags that we knew we were never going to wear in public. I mean, I don't know if, if you had this experience with your mom, but my mom would buy clothes for us that we knew we would like one thing. I don't know where mom, she bought us a lot of matching stuff. And I don't know where she read this, that one thing guys really dig is dressing identical. But, uh, but it, that, that was, that was uh, kind of humiliating. That, and, and, and then the other thing was, um, they explained, my mom was a kindergarten teacher. She was, a, she, and I love that. I mean, she was a lot of fun. She was very creative. But the problem was she couldn't just leave that at work. And, and so, so whenever she did stuff, she had to kind of make it fun and create. So like I had a pair of, I had a pair of shorts, my favorite pair of shorts. And I got a, a rip right, right there in the leg, I guess just the, just the muscle. And, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, anyway, I, um, it, it ripped. Well, well, my mom sewed it up. She, she fixed it, but she didn't just stitch it. You know what she did? She, she, on my favorite shorts, in big red block letters on my left thigh, she sewed the word howdy. <laughs> like, that's going to help me make friends, you know? <laughs> hey, guys. You know, I, I mean, uh, you know, it's like, I'm not going to, you could get beat up for that. And, 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 and so, I, I, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't complain, but I did not like it. But everything came to a head in the summer of my 10th year. Because that was the year I was going to go away by myself to camp. And I can still remember mom comes in and, and just this, all of a sudden this blizzard of, of apparel flying through the air. All of which has my name sewn in it. And, uh, and all of a sudden I just, I stunned. I just stunned my mom because I stepped in between her and the bag. Ten years old I go, mom, stop. I'm not taking that stuff. I'm not taking the howdy shorts. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it. And, 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 uh, and, uh, and, and, and my brother just gasped uh, because this was, this was direct defiance. You know, we all understood that. This, and my mom was a good mom, but she was strict. You know, uh, I, I mean, just to give you an example, when she got mad at us, she didn't, you know, what she, she didn't spank us. You know what she would do? She would comb our hair. And it's still hard to talk about. And, and I just remember, uh, you know, I, I, there was this long, long pause and, and, uh, and, and, and a hush in the room and the air was still. And I can remember I thinking, she's going to go for the brush. And, 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 and all of a sudden, my mom looked at me and said, okay, okay, you can pack your own bag. But if you don't have something you need... It will be your responsibility. And I'm like, holy cow. <laughs> no howdy shorts. And, 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 and I mention that because, because here's, what, here's what I've observed over the years. Uh, is that I think sometimes the precise same thing happens in church. It, it happens especially if you grow up in church. Like if you're here this morning and, and, and your parents kind of brought you to church or, or you're, you're, you're here this morning and you come to church, that, that I don't care what age you are, what happens at church is this. We basically want to pack your faith bag for you. You know, 
Uh, you, you come, and in the sermon, but don't forget to put this uh, in your bag, and, and, and this, you, you're going to need this doctrine, just, and don't forget to just stuff that truth in there, and, and, but what about, just, just shut up, put it in, and, and, and you got all this stuff in the bag, and it's fine, it's fine as long as we got all these people here to help us carry it, you know, but somewhere, for every single one of us in this room, someday, some morning you wake up, and it hits you. That if I'm really going to take seriously these beliefs that I say I embrace, if I'm really going to take these beliefs seriously, these beliefs, these ideas and, and doctrines in this bag, this bag could get kind of heavy when I'm walking down the hallway of my high school. This bag could, could be kind of cumbersome uh, in, in the corridors at the office. And this bag could come between me and my buddies when we go out. And, and in this bag, I don't know if I want people seeing that bag when they show up at the house. And, and so what happens is people like us, just like us, what we do is we say, well, you know what? I believe in God and everything, but I don't think you need to believe that. And like, I totally love Jesus, I, mean, I really do, but I don't think you have to believe that. And I mean, I'm a total Christian, but I don't really think you have to have that in your bag. And what happens is little by little by little, we take these things out. And so at some point down the road, we're walking around with this bag that still says Christianity. But there's only one problem. What's that? It's empty. We have the form of religion but we lack the power. We lack the power thereof. And at the heart of our problem is that we do not own our own faith. It is not a, it is not a first-hand faith. One of the main ideas that I think Jesus wants us to understand in this passage, John chapter 15, is this. Second-hand fellowship is a lousy substitute for first-hand fellowship. Jesus is calling us to a first-hand faith. In fact, it's interesting. When you read through this passage, John chapter 15, there are 27 different verses in the chapter. But in those 27 verses, Jesus speaks in the first person, I, me, my, mine, no fewer than 44 times. 44 times. He, he's trying to communicate. This is a person-to-person -person call. That if, if you actually carry chapter 15 into the fourth verse of chapter 16, which a lot of Bible scholars say we should do, that, that, that Jesus' teaching extends into chapter 16 for four verses, then actually the total becomes 46 times Jesus uses this first person language in 27 verses. And, and mind you, that's just counting the Greek, some of you know this, some of you may not, but in the Greek, the, the, the pronoun is actually included in the verb. So if you actually think about the English translation of what Jesus is saying here, it's more like 60 different times Jesus makes a first person reference in one chapter. He wants us to understand this is about person to person call. This is about first-hand faith. This is about an intimacy. I in you, you in me. Jesus is talking to us about a very, very first-hand relationship. In fact, seven times, seven times in this John 15 passage, we, 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 we read some form of this phrase, abide in me abide in my love. I'm sure you, you observe that. You notice that just over and over. Abide in me. Abide in my love. Now, it's true. We, we follow Jesus as a community together. That's who we are at Faith Bridge. We worship as a community. We serve as a community. We, we give and, and, and celebrate and mourn as a community. But there has to be, for every one of us in this room, that first-hand embrace at some point. It's not enough to follow some people who are following some people who are following Jesus. Jesus said, deny yourself, take up your cross. You follow me. When you look at this text, Jesus is using very, very personal language in this passage. Verse four, you in me, I in you. You say, okay, but how do, I, how do I experience that sort of intimacy with God? How can I, how can I develop that, 
how can I nurture that personal relationship with Jesus? How do I, how do I nurture a first-hand faith? And Jesus actually tells us in this passage that there are at least two ways, two ways that we can nurture a first-hand relationship with Jesus, even in the heart of the jungle. The first of those ways is by loving the words of Jesus. The second of those ways is by living the words of Jesus. So let's look at each one for just a moment. First of all, uh, loving the words of Jesus. Look at verse 7. Verse 7. Jesus wants us to understand the first first element of, of building an intimacy with him is learning to love his words. In verse 7, notice Jesus says, if... That's a big word, a conditional term. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. One of the ways we develop a firsthand faith is we cultivate a love for Jesus' teaching, a love for Jesus' words. Why? Why? Because the more you love somebody, the more you want to hear their words, the more you want to know their thoughts, the more you want to get inside their head and their plans, the more you desire a relationship with them. Um, Just do a quick survey. How many of you here this morning are between the ages of 14 and 17 years old? 14, 17, just raise your hand if you are. No, sir, you're lying. Uh, so, so 14, 17, let me see. Put your hand up there, be brave. Come on, be brave. It's all right, I'm not gonna embarrass you. I promise. Okay, all right, all right, I trust you. Uh, okay, now, here's the thing. If you're between the age of 14, 17, there was a study that came out in 2012 that says this. Pew Research Center uh, for Internet uh, and, um, and Life Project, that if you're between 14 and 17 years old, on the average, you send approximately 100 texts per day, per day, uh, and, and to your friends and your, and your BFFs. Now, 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 why do you do that? Why, do you, why would you do that? Because you understand. You get it. You get it. That the more you value a relationship with somebody, the more you want to hear their words. The more you want to hear their words. And I I totally understand. You know, I am, a, I, am, I am a fan, a big fan, a rabid fan of James Taylor. James Taylor, singer, songwriter. I love his music. And I've sort of invited James into my heart. Uh, and, and in some ways, his words abide in me. You might say, well, what, what, what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean is I, I love his songs. I love his lyrics, his words. I, I, I know them. I've, I, I memorize them. I, I think about them sometimes. Literally, there's a phrase in one of James Taylor's songs that says, the secret of life is enjoying the passage of time. And just last week, I just remember, I don't know what, I I found myself thinking about that phrase, just wondering about that phrase. Sometimes they even speak his words as if they're my own, that they begin to kind of seep into my normal everyday conversation. Somebody say, Duffy, you know, how's your your week been? And I'll say, well, I've seen fire and I've seen rain. (laughs) And I've seen lonely days that I thought would never end. And and it's funny, if you actually say that to a 15-year-old, They'll look at you and go, shake it off, shake, shake, shake it off. You know, it's like, our words, our words are very much tied to our relationship. Jesus puts it this way in John chapter 8, verses 31 to 32. He says, if you continue, if you continue, and by the way, the, the verb there, continue, is the very same verb, meno, that is used in John chapter 15 for the word abide. So, so basically Jesus is saying in John chapter 8, if you continue, if you live with, if you abide in my word, in my word, you will really be my disciples. Disciples learn to love his word. If you're abiding in Jesus, Living with Jesus, his words are abiding in, living in you, impacting you, transforming you. We study them. We, we share them. We meditate on them. We memorize them. Uh, Paul uh, talks about it in, in these terms. He says in Colossians chapter 3, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. 
Because that's the first way. That's the first way that we, that we nurture this firsthand faith. That's the way we nurture this intimacy with God. That's what it means to abide. We let the word of Christ dwell in us. The second way, the second way that the scripture talks to us about, about nurturing this, this firsthand faith is through obedience. Through obedience. In other words, it's not just enough to love Jesus' words. We're called to live Jesus' words. Um, some of you, I think, have met my wife, Maggie. She's been with me uh, several times here to Faith Bridge. Um, and occasionally, uh, you know, in my sermons, I'll talk about her because I love her a lot and, and, and because I abide with her. And, um, and, uh, and, but all of us who are married understand, and I think most of us who aren't married understand, that to some extent, talk is cheap. Right, that, that if you really want to abide with somebody, it's got to be more than just words. It's got to be, it's got to be deeds. It, it's important that she does feel heard. It's important that I take her, her words and her thoughts and her ideas seriously. But, but beyond that, she needs to see in my life that I embrace her concerns, that I, that I value her dreams, that I anticipate her her wishes, uh, even before she expresses them because, I, because I, 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 I abide with her. And so that's what I try to do. That's what I, I try to do. If Maggie says, uh, and this happens a lot, Maggie goes, uh, tonight is garbage night. <laughs> Tonight's gar- now, she doesn't have to say anything to me. Uh, she doesn't have to say one other word. Uh, I start collecting the garbage. And, why? Because I love her. I love her. So, so I, I bet, because I love, or, or maybe Maggie says, uh, hey, we need to uh, bring in some firewood. She doesn't have to say one other word. She doesn't have to beg and plead. Uh, I, I basically go out there and I start bringing in a load of firewood. Why? Because I love her. Uh, Maggie says, oh, uh, d- d- hey, we, do we bring in the mail? I know what that means. I go out to the mailbox and I get the mail. And why don't, she doesn't have to say anything. Why do I do it? Because I love her. Maggie, Maggie says after dinner, hey, these, these dishes need to be washed. Uh, so what do I do? I immediately, she doesn't have to say anything. I go get her rubber gloves and, uh, and, 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 and give them to her. Why? Because, uh, because that dishwasher, that water's not good for her hands. And because I love her. Now, on most days, on most days, I'll be honest with you, this is not hard for me. This is not hard for me. I love her. It is the fruit. It is the fruit of our relationship. Now, of course, there are times when it is hard. Sometimes I miscalculate. Sometimes I misread. Sometimes I just get it wrong. I'll never forget the one time, you know, I, I mean, how was I to know she didn't want a, 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 a brand new table saw? I, I mean, but, but, but the more I get to know her, the more our relationship deepens, the more intimately I abide with her, the more I desire to serve her, the better I know how to do it. This, this is a true story. Several years ago, I don't even remember when this happened, but several years ago, uh, I, I think by this time we had already been married probably for 20 years. So we, we had been through a lot together, a lot of life. But well, one day, one day, just I happened to open her car door for her. And it wasn't something I normally did, right? I mean, I just, I just happened to do it that day for the first time. I don't know why. I was just trying to be nice. Uh, I remember because we had just left uh, Home Depot where we'd returned a table saw. And, uh, and, uh, but but, uh, but uh, she commented to me how much she appreciated me opening the car door for her. So every day, every time since then, I open her car. Because that's what love does. That's what love does. See, what Jesus is describing in John chapter 15, verse 10, is not some sort of uh, obedience based on law. It's an obedience based on love. In, In fact, in John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will keep my commandments. And now here, he sort of flips it in chapter 15, verse 10. Jesus says, if you keep my commandments... You will abide in my love. Now, now you might be going, well, Duffy, that is just so uh, wonderful. I wish you hadn't said this in front of my wife, but, but uh, it, it, it's, it's very touching. Uh, but here's my problem. I don't feel love for God the way you seem to feel love for Maggie. Maybe if I did feel love for God, I'd be more motivated to live for him uh, and abide in him, but I just don't feel it. I just don't feel it. 
Here's my suggestion to you this morning. Act like you do. Act like you, whether you feel it or not, act like you do. One of the most basic laws of human behavior is that you almost never feel yourself into a way of acting. You act yourself into a way of feeling. I, just, I, I guarantee you, for example, most people who love running, and, 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 and trust me, look at me, I think I know about this, uh, that, that, uh, that most people who love running, people, people you know, who, who uh, wouldn't miss a day without going out for a nice 5K jog, they didn't begin that first day, that first run, that first mile thinking, golly, this is fun. You know, and if they did, they're nuts. You know, but I guarantee you, they didn't like it. It was hard. It required of them discipline. But they didn't feel themselves into a way of acting. They acted themselves into a way of feeling. This morning, if you're not feeling it, if, 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 let me suggest you begin to act like you do. Act on what you know of God's love for you, what he did for you on the cross. And trust him to bring the fruit of obedience from his life in you. Because here's what it comes down to. Here's what it comes down to. If you're struggling this morning, sort of in the jungle, and you're finding that your joy as a Christian seems to be limited to just random uh, treetop moments. If your Christian life uh, seems to sort of stagger and stumble between Sundays, uh, they are, are every week between youth group or, or, or small group, it could come down to two questions, two important questions. Number one, do you love the words of Jesus? Do you love the words of Jesus? And then question number two, are you willing to live the words of Jesus. Because the first key to beating this trap of Tarzan Christianity, trying to live from treetop to treetop, living out our faith authentically in the jungle, is a first hand faith. Abide in me and I in you. You know, I think part of what makes Tarzan Christianity so tragic is that it wastes an opportunity for joy. It wastes an opportunity for power. Imagine a lamp that, that has all the capacity to bring light, but all it offers is darkness because it's not plugged into the socket. Think, think about, a, think about uh, amazing music uh, that, that, that is coming through a speaker, but all you hear is silence because the cable is not plugged in to the source of the song. Imagine a branch, Jesus said, that has this remarkable capacity to bear fruit and sweetness and refreshment and color and beauty, but it offers nothing because it's not plugged into the vine. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me, stay with me, stick with me in a firsthand way, and you will, not you might, not you could, you will bear much fruit. Learn to love his word. Learn to live his word. We don't have to settle. We don't have to settle for Tarzan Christianity. The Christian life is, is not about swinging from, from treetop to treetop to treetop. It is about intentionally, joyfully, consistently clinging to the vine. Let's pray. It's easy, Lord, with, um, it's easy with sermons like this that are, are sort of, there's mystery to it. How do we abide with Christ? What does it mean to be joined to, to Jesus when Jesus is not is not physically present? What does it mean to have him living in us in some sort of mysterious way? It's easy to sort of let this stuff blow over as just ideas, interesting abstract concepts. But Lord, what you want to do in this room this morning is very vivid and very practical. 
It is literally life-changing. There are people in this room, some of them perhaps for years have been showing up on Sunday, but walking through the jungle for the rest of the week. And others maybe who, um, who maybe for the first time are wondering if there is the possibility of joy in the jungle. And today for the first time, they've wondered about this vine, this vine and what it might mean to be abiding in that sort of love and joy. Lord, I pray that you would haunt us, haunt us this day, this week with the possibilities of your grace and your love that our joy might be full because you are in us and we're full of you. Help us, Lord, to abide in the vine. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Bible teacher Duffy Robbins, who just brought a great follow-up to our Transform series called Tarzan Christianity, and really talking about abiding. Mm -hmm. um, That's right. It's such a bridge, really, from finishing up Transformed and thinking, yes, I want my life to be transformed. I, God, I want you to move in it, but how do I do that? Right. And uh, today we talked about two things, really. We talked about the love of God's Word, cu yep. cultivating the love of God's Word and being in His Word and then being obedient. Right. To, um, yeah. So I have just a couple of questions around both of those things um, and some of your points. So whether I've been a believer, I'm a new believer, or I've been a believer for a long time, and I just don't engage God's Word regularly, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, how do I cultivate that in my life? How do I grow that love for God's Word that you were talking about? Um, well, I think, first of all, let's be honest. Uh, scripture is kind of an acquired taste. Mm -hmm. I mean, some parts of it are, are sort of spicy and maybe, you, you know, you go, oh, Revelation, you know, dragons and stuff and, and the whore of Babylon, you know, okay, this is intriguing. But, but, uh, but I mean, for the most part, I think it is an acquired taste. Mm -hmm. And, and to that extent, uh, I think it's, it's, it's something that we believe has value, that we believe it has some worth, and uh, and we say, I'm going to consume this. I'm gonna I'm gonna take this in, um, and 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 trust that God will change my attitude. You know, the psalmist says, <clears throat> I think it's in Psalm 19, but it's a couple of other places as well, that your word is like a honey, mm -hmm. you know, a honey sweet like a honeycomb, and and uh, but I don't think for most of us it's that way at the beginning. And the problem is, if you if you are like you said, sort of new at this, or you're just you know you're not a person that reads scripture a lot. You hear these people talking about how it wasn't that sweet, wasn't that great, what? A, and you're kind of going, oh, it was all right. I kind of dozed off, and after two or three doves were killed, I kind of lost interest. And 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 uh, and so I think part of it is is let's let's just be realistic that it is kind of an acquired taste. Some portions are more engaging than others. If I were just starting out. Um, I would, so the first thing I do is say, this is an acquired taste, and I'm going to have to take some time to acquire it. But secondly, I would probably start with narrative passages of Scripture, because I think they're, they're, um, they're more interesting. They, we, we all love a good story, um, and there are many, many good stories um, you know, in Scripture. So you know, it might be one of the Gospels, or, or maybe I would read you know, Exodus or, or Judges or or Genesis or something like that. And then I think, uh, I think, you know, Mark Twain's advice about, you know, he said, it's not the parts of the Bible that I, you know, don't understand, it's the parts that I do understand that trouble me. I would say, give yourself permission. If you're just all of a sudden, you're, you're kind of cruising along and, and the next thing you know, you're in a ditch or you're, you're just in the weeds and you go, I don't know what the heck we're talking about here. There's a bunch of names that I've never heard and places I've never been to. Skip it. Go, you know, go on to the, you know, give yourself permission. Um, it's not a book like you read for school where you're supposed to start at the front and go to the There's back. The and so I, I, would, I would say those are sort of the ways one does it. Um, I don't, uh, you know, myself, I don't drink wine, but I think people who do drink wine, they will often say when I, I, it's the first <laughs> it's taste. Acquired. Yeah, yeah, that it's an acquired taste. And... Um, 
and and so I think it's 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 like that. Mm -hmm. It's it takes that it takes that time. Over time, you know, it becomes something that you savor, you appreciate its subtleties. And uh, this is my wine uh, gesture. I got okay. Yeah, I got that. And, uh, <laughs> and and so I think it's 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 going to be that you have to give yourself uh, room though to say, hey, if I don't love this the first time, that doesn't mean I, I'm I'm not susceptible to scripture. Yeah, that's good. That's good because yeah. it, it is overwhelming at first, especially if you don't read it a lot to yeah. to try and understand. So that's a great place to start. And so when we're talking about obedience. Mm -hmm. um, you were talking about um, being obedient because of the love God has given us. We mm -hmm. love Him to be obedient. And you, you did a great job pointing out that um, our feelings don't always lead to action. Sometimes we have to commit to the action first mm -hmm. to get the feeling. So right. obedience is hard. We don't feel like doing some of the things I think that God asks us to do, not at least at first. Yeah. Um, can you talk more? And, and maybe never. And maybe never. Yes. <laughs> <Some> <laughs> Although it, yeah. when you can see when it's for your good, when you see yeah. those, it becomes yeah. a little easier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so talk more to me about the about the faking it part. Let's just say, to speak more of what you're speaking about. Let's say I'm, I'm, I'm either relatively new to my faith or I'm trying to understand what it means to be obedient. Tell me where I start. What are things that I should be obedient to okay. to make the decision that I'm going to be obedient to these things, even yeah. if I don't feel like it. Yeah. Well, I think first of all to recognize that that we are a broken people. In other words, our appetites, our feelings deceive us. Yeah. And so, I mean, we know this because um, we consume foods that we know are not good for us. We neglect exercises that we know are good for. I mean, so we know right off the bat our feelings are suspect that we overrule them routinely. And we all, you know, we, we do this. And so um, this is another instance in which we have to, you know, have some suspicion of our feelings and not just say, oh, I don't feel this, therefore I, I don't do it. Now, to me, that's partially, that's partially a matter of, of just common sense and intelligence, uh, whether you're a Christian or not. As I say, you, you, there are certain, you know, certain you know, eating a salad, whether that's, you, you say, I don't really feel like that, you know, but tough darts, I'm going to eat that. So um, I think you exercise that same discipline in, in, in your spiritual life and say, I don't feel like doing this, but I know it's good for me to do it. I know I, I should do it. Um, secondly is um, I would, uh, I would, I, I like to say, take baby steps. Um, in other words, I think um, there's sort of this idea uh, that that I have to do something grandiose and something yeah. big, and it's sort of that old deal of how to eat an elephant one bite at a time. Um, that if I if I I can think of some jobs that I have to do, some tasks. When I think about doing that, I just go, I don't want to do that. If I think oh, I'll just do this little bit. Um, so, you know, I guess it would be like if I were going to drive to California, I might go, oh my gosh, that would take me forever. But if I go, well, I'm just going to drive, you know. 200 miles, and then we're going to stop, or you know, we're going to eat, and and I'm going to sort of break it up. I think that's an important part of it. So if we're, you know, where I trying to kind of work this thing out in my own life, I might say, what are some baby steps that I can take? Baby steps of obedience I can take, mm -hmm. that perhaps I won't love it, but it will be less painful than taking the giant step that I know I hate. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and so I think uh, I would do it. I would sort of approach it that. way. That would be another way I would uh, sort of, you know, build in some of that. Um, and then, um, and then, as I said today, I really do think that sometimes um, our, our faking it becomes authentic. And, and of course, when I say, you know, act like you do, um, I don't mean necessarily, uh, you know, mime uh, obedience as much as I mean act it out act it out. That's the way we learn speech. That's the way we learn writing. That's the way we learn every skill is um, you, go, you, you say, I'm not going to play football until I really know how to play football. No, you, you have to get out there and, and, and do it. You kind of work on it. And, uh, and so I think to some extent, obedience is like that. Of course, you know, 
part of that is we're afraid we'll drop the ball, we'll fumble, you know, we'll you know, run the wrong direction. But that's where grace comes into play, is that this is not about you doing enough stuff that, um, that you can make God love you. God already loves you. He's already invited us to abide with him. To me, that's the wonder. Uh, I didn't talk about it today, but that, that it's, you know, I in you and you in me, that uh, this is not about, um, you know, Jesus saying, you've got you to gotta come all the way. I've already come. And in fact, in Revelation 3.20, there's a parallel to, to what um, we see in John 15, where Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And I will, if, if any man opens the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. And so Jesus, in, in the image there is Jesus coming to our place. He's, he's not meeting us halfway. He's going 100% of the way. And so um, I think that's a really important part of it as well, that, uh, that I don't have to fear the fumble. I don't have to fear dropping the ball. I don't have to fear that I may get penalized. Uh, th th this is a God who, who loves me. And ultimately, in that passage, he says in verse 11, I'm not doing this to make you unhappy, to make you miserable, to... You know, uh, I am doing this so that your joy might be full. Good, good word. Um, so you're going to continue on next yes, week. We're going right. to continue looking at John. We'll be back. John 15. Yeah. Jump back, back in John 15. Yeah. Um, so we'll take those two things and be obedient with those yeah. this week. Yes. Yeah. So what a great word. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it. It's yeah. a great We're passage. Glad to have it's, you back. It's so rich. There's so much in it. Mm -hmm. um, it's really been fun kind of going back and studying it. Together. Awesome. Well, thanks yeah. for being here with us today. You bet, Thank, Thank you. you for joining us here for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.